It may be wrong, but for me is the traditional, because we now do have a tradition of, of digital education, the traditional ed online or multimedia, multimedia digital learning was a student with a computer that had a multimedia program in it. Uh, you listened, you watched, you repeated. It was almost like programmed learning because it wasn't really, a t it was the teacher, but the focus was on the content. So you had only really a one-way relationship here, the computer to the student, the student absorbed what the, the computer gave out. This is, was our first step, at least in, in the chronology that I saw of online learning. Next slide, please. Then we evolved a little more and we got a little more relationship into it because we actually had a teacher coordinating the materials. The content still came to you by the, probably via computer, maybe, maybe you got a, a, a VHS in the mail, maybe you got some books. But the main channel of communication was by email between the teacher and the student. So this became the tra traditional online learning once the teacher was involved. Still almost programmed, but now at least we do have two-way communication, teacher to student, one-to-one. -one. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Later on, now, we have a freer environment. We're developing, we're experimenting, we're playing, and we, we're going to open new possibilities of, of dynamics because we're going to have more students as we open what we consider best practices because we're going to have, as you will see, a much more dynamic, right away, even without the relationships, it's already a more dynamic uh, diagram. When I first started uh, an MBA online, we did begin to have a real classroom situation. We had now a whole group of students and we had a teacher, we had our materials. However, at the beginning it was my experience that online courses were all parallel. There were uh, Many relationships, student, teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher. There was a classroom, there were a lot of us learning together, but there was no interaction student, student. It was still a one-way relationship, although at least we had the advantage of knowing there was more than one of us. We were not alone, but we still didn't have complete interaction. At this point, the internet came very strongly into play and a focus changed because now that we have online abilities, the content itself is no longer as important. Why? Because you can get the material, you just need no, to know where to find it. The text, the material, well obviously if a first grade class, a first grade teacher nowadays needs a master's degree in education, there has to be something more than content going on here because the first grade material is how to read and how to add two and two. If you need a master's degree, it's because something else is going on. And I see that we are now maximizing it. Next screen, please. When we have finally started working and maximizing our relationships, we, we are using the internet as a repository of information. We're finding all of our information online. We're getting new information every day. The information changes every day. We need to learn from each other how to find that information, how to analyze that information, how to manipulate that, that information, and build new constructions with it. So now, the change from the previous slide to this slide with the methods we're going to show you in this best practices because to me it's obvious that we do have a best practice that we're working on, that we're changing, that we're developing, that we'd like to share with you and hear how you can add to this diagram. But here in our best practices we're going to show you how we can take the most advantage of the expertise of every single student, have interactions on every single level and change a static diagram into a, an extremely dy dynamic, moving, learning, energized situation. So, uh, blah, blah, I'll go back to you. That's... Hmm? As you say, okay. Thank you. Uh, well, when you, when you show this, this graphics, this looks quite complex. Huh? Uh, I wouldn't say that our program is that complex, but probably it is. <laughs> 
kidding. The, the, the next speaker is Prianti, who is one of the tutors. He was one of the participants of our uh, program. She, sorry, she, are you she? Yeah. Uh, she was a very successful participant of our program, and now she's a tutor. Uh, so she's going to briefly go through how does our program function, uh, so that you have the input of, of uh, what do we do uh, within the training. Prianti? discuss on the particular aspects of capacity building program in internet governance which Diplo has conducted. So uh, one major aspect of what Ginger was telling is the art of communication. So when it comes to online communication we would think that naturally the, the student will not or hardly ever get a chance to see the teacher and uh, and it's more or less that you are you know you remain a very inactive student but the the Amazing factor in the Diplo capacity building program is that the, the amount of the strength of the affinity among, among the students and also the collaboration with the students and the teacher. So it's the art of communication. So um, internet governance is a building under construction as we always discuss in our content. It has several aspects infrastructure and standardization, legal basket, economic basket, social cultural basket, and development basket. So these things are, the, these five aspects are merged in the learning material and it's provided in a very interactive format. So we have a range of students who participate. They range from like uh, students to media, policy makers, very highly skilled professionals, lawyers, business people. So wide range of people with wide range of capacities. How it is done is the process of using a toolkit and we use the online tools and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and also learning by doing. The training of the course is online and we also have a research phase and also a facilitating of communities of practice. So the foundation course is the basic understanding of sharing the context where the participants with varying backgrounds, they will also contribute to the content, so which makes it very fulfilled and which is also modified later on. So this is some of the screen views of our learning material. You would see that uh, the when it, when you, this is the screen that one would see when they enter the classroom. So first we get the blog and each person is encouraged to post as many blog messages as possible to keep the class running. And another feature in the learning material, the learning classroom is the addition of annotations and links. It is like you can also, each, each student can argue and debate on the particular comment that a fellow student has added and also the tutors will add on and also the coordinators. So it becomes very interactive. You not only read what is given but you also learn from your peers. This is again another feature. It is called the forum where we debate on different aspects on the lecture material. And we have a weekly chat session which is very interactive where all the students meet online, they meet each other and also they interact with the tutors. And if by any chance anybody misses the classroom, the chat session, they can also add any comments later on to the chat history. So this is some of the photographs that the students have taken. I'm sure we can see some of you in here. The interactivity is very much seen. This is the participation at several workshops which Diplo has sponsored. 
So for the four years of the IG internet capacity building program, Diplo has trained over 400 uh, participants. So they reach from different regions, and in 2008 batch, there were 700 applicants and 100 135 participants were selected. They were made into nine regional groups, and we also had four uh, multi bilingual groups. The one was French English, Spanish English, Portuguese English, and Arabic English. So you would see how the amount of uh, interactivity we have imposed on the sessions. We also keep on the links with the students, and uh, you can also see that in diplointernetgovernance.org, where the past students also interact with the present students and make the interactivity keeping it alive, and it, it never dies. The classroom is still alive. So let me continue, give the mic to Lada. Thank you, Pri. This was really short and sweet. Um, now, now I got attracted with this second link. The first one is, of course, the website of Diplo. The second one is what she mentioned, the community of practice. I think Rafik will probably reflect on that as well uh, later on. But you're more than, more than welcomed, even if you're not a Diplo fellow, join uh, the community because you can communicate with uh, different people all over the world on different topics related to IG. It's a social network. It's, it's really brilliant. Um, now, uh, a little bit uh, from Ginger again on, uh, on, on a training approach, uh, and then we'll move to uh, participants' experience. Ginger. Okay, thank you. Priyanti mentioned uh, the multilingual programs, because as we work, we're of course experimenting, we are learning ourselves, expanding and changing the program. One of the new developments is we started with a bilingual Spanish-English program, which then developed, as Priyanti mentioned, into four bilingual groups, with the purpose of giving the complete experience to the participant. Most, of, most, if not all, of our, almost all, of our participants have English as a second language. This makes it very difficult sometimes to assimilate complex, intangible terms, phrases, and ideas. It's not as easy as, as mathematics or, or objects, okay? We're talking when, when even the experts can't decide what net neutrality means, imagine working with it in a, in a second language. So what we are doing is trying to combine the international language of English in the main text and the platform, then I'll offer the student or participant the possibility of interacting in their native language. So where they might be at a disadvantage because they can't use nonverbal cues, they have, are writing, they're not just speaking and trying to communicate and using uh, eye contact and whatever methods they can to help themselves, they're having to write. So the tool that we're using is to offer the materials in English on the website, the platform is in English, the, material, the main text is available for download in their native language. Uh, how many languages is text? UN in all of the UN languages and more. And more. So they can study the text offline in their native language and then participate in the hypertext discussions, all the layers of Inter interaction that Priyanthi described, the class discussion over the text, the blog, the forum, can be done in their native language. They can even present their exams in their native language so that we are eliminating the language and the obstacle of expression in the coursework, although they're still gaining the, the advantage of dominating the the vocabulary that they will need to work in international policy uh, processes. So if they come to the Internet Governance Forum, they've at least seen everything in English. They can understand what's going on and they have the first step necessary to move towards uh, complete interaction with, with all of the international policy processes, which is our goal. We have a very, very good example uh, through an initiative on the part of India with Nixie, who took this uh, interaction to exactly perfect timing because they partnered with, Dixie, uh, with Diplo 
to propose a course for I, internet governance for India during the preparation activities and the, uh, the I can call it in Spanish, it, preparatory to the IDF so that there is a group of 30, two groups A and B, uh, which formed 30 India participants, young men and women, uh, as mentioned, Priyanthi, from as young, young students, uh, business people, academics, we have PhDs, people smarter than me, we have uh, politicians, and we have uh, uh, Nixie, CFI members. So there's a wide range of people, people to ask questions, people to answer questions, people to propose idealistic new ideas, and people to wonder where did that idea come from. It's uh, the mix of people from not only different professions, legal, economic, uh, uh, sociocultural, technical, engineers, who can each offer n their own perspective on each of the problems, but at the same time pick up and fill in their weak areas, but also the inexperienced viewpoint, which may come up with something innovative, the person who asks the provocative question, and the chance for the experienced academic to share his knowledge that's up to date in his profession. So. Uh, this, it's as, uh, it's, it just as this course was as dynamic as the dances we saw last night on stage. I don't know how many of you went to the dinner and saw the whirling, twirling flames and baskets balancing. Well, I felt like this course showed exactly that much skill with the concepts, with the communication, with all the activity going on and ending exactly in time for uh, many, out of 30, 12 were awarded by Nixie. The 12 best were awarded fellowships and are here putting into practice the theories that they learned in this two month course. We, I, I personally, having worked with them, am extremely proud of them. I thank Nixie for its initiative and India for putting on my favorite IGF. So I've seen not only these 12 fellows actually put into action what they talked about and what they learned and what they idealized about. They're actually, if you come to walking the talk, they are walking the talk. And not only them, but there are some eight or more other participants from the course who are here actually working participating more than any of us because they're behind the scenes, fixing, preparing, getting. I see several of them back there who, who did more work than any of us, preparing for months before and during. So Nixie here has given us an opportunity to prove that this dynamic, exciting Indian energy can be carried out into an educational program and turned into concrete, immediate action that will then carry over during this next year as they prepare for Cairo, where we hope to see them all. Thanks, Ginger. Uh, so the one of the participants from the Indian course is just next to you, and it would be perfect to hear from him um, how is what is the feeling after the course, and where do you see yourself uh, in in the future period? Uh, well, uh, my name is Siva Subramanian Muttaswamy. I'm uh, from ISOC India Chennai chapter, and as a participant of ISOC and as a person. I've been immensely interested in internet governance, in the evolution of in internet. And with this interest, I've been taking part in uh, the Internet Governance Caucus uh, mailing list and uh, in the ISOC chapter delegates mailing list to discuss uh, various aspects of internet governance and uh, the evolution of internet. And uh, I was, uh, my views were uh, rather uneducated and um, I did not have a complete understanding of the issues. I had a superficial understanding of the issues and uh, with that understanding, with that limited understanding, I was participating and uh, those in the ISOC uh, chapter list and uh, in the Internet Governance Caucus list and other lists have been more than kind and uh, encouraging often very gently pointing out uh, 
the errors in my views and being very supportive. And it, it was at that point uh, that I became acutely conscious that I need to learn, get a complete understanding, uh, uh, overall uh, picture of uh, all the issues in internet governance. And it was at that point of time that uh, Rajesh Agarwal from Nixi sent me an email uh, asking me to take part in the internet governance capacity program. And I'm not sure if it, uh, the invitation came from Rajesh Agarwal or uh, it was God sent. It was so timely and uh, I jumped in, I filled up an application, jumped in, then wrote to a friend in Mexico, or you say Mexico? <laughs> okay. I wrote a friend in Mexico who said, um, I, I said, uh, I'm taking part in a course by a foundation called Diplo. And uh, he said, yes, uh, Diplo Foundation, and uh, he told me about Diplo Foundation, and then he told me that uh, this course will do tremendous good to you, and uh, he felt very happy for me. And uh, with that, I became very involved in that course and took an active part, and uh, found that the course was uh, very uniquely designed, and it was an online course, and it did not feel like an online classroom. It, was, it felt more like a... Uh, real classroom in a real setting and uh, uh, the design of the course was unique. I, I would like to use the term participative, participatory learning to describe uh, the style of teaching. We had uh, Virginia Ginger Park and uh, Priyanti Danavate as instructors and uh, the instructors became co-participants. And uh, whether we were qualified or not, the instructors made the participants co-instructors. So we participated and uh, learned participatively. And on Diplo's part, the course was so well structured. It um, did not exclude any point of view. It included uh, the very angry point of view of um, John Parry Barlow, I mean, uh, his point of view when he was very angry. To moderate views, to non-committal views, covered various approaches to internet governance, covered various topics of internet governance, covered everything. Covered uh, the point of view from north, south, point of view from uh, rich and poor countries, and in the process gave us a complete, comprehensive, overall understanding of what internet governance is all about, and what we are talking about, and how it is important. So, in effect, we learned quite a lot from Diplo, and Diplo helped us design the course in such a way that we, may, we learn from each other as well. Together it uh, made a complete experience. I find the course so valuable that I have uh, two suggestions that I want to place on record that I want both Diplo and the Government of India to take note. One, I'll, I'll take the liberty to say on behalf of all participants that we enjoyed the course and uh, most of us would like to go move on to the next level. Please. Okay. Should we take a vote? Okay. Uh, uh, I, I hope this gets passed on to Rajesh Agarwal, uh, who is not here, and uh, take a note of Virginia and Priyanti and uh, Vladi, Vlada that uh, we would like to take part in the next level of uh, dip Diplo course as well as. Uh, uh, would like to have an opportunity to take part in the master's program at Malta. That's in February, I think. That's very exciting to know about. And the other suggestion is, uh, this course has been so useful, has given us so much clarity, and is bound to have given those in uh, government and in the policy making process, everyone, clarity of uh, thought and clarity of judgment that I want to actually suggest to Diplo that it extends its sphere of teaching beyond internet governance and diplomacy and actually move on to conventional governance as well. If you can design courses 
for policy makers and politicians and uh, those in public administration, I'm, I'm using these terms very respectably, politicians and public administrators, mm -hmm. and um, structure courses that will help add clarity to the policy making process. There will be much better progress around the world, all around, and the world will be a better place to live. Thank you very much, Diplo. Thank you on behalf of all the participants. Thank you. He already got the certificate, so he doesn't have to uh, lie in <laughs> to get it. No, thank you very much for this. Uh, I, will, I will pass on the, 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 the message to, to the heads. Yeah. Uh, this is a good idea, definitely. We have been working on uh, environment as well, courses uh, on internet governance. There have been uh, courses on health and diplomacy. This one could definitely work. Uh, what we do have experience with and expertise in a way uh, is uh, learning methodology. So I just hope that we can that we can do that, but uh, again, the initiative uh, has to go with, from you, and you should be involved in that, in, in building up the, the whole uh, new courses. But that's that's absolutely right. I'll use the opportunity to uh, thank to Nixie once again for this uh, for this uh, support, uh, not only for financial support for the course for the Indians, but also for the support for bringing all of you here to take part in the process. Right. Uh, with this, I will, I will conclude the first part of the session, and I will ask if there is any questions from the audience to the panel. It's about the program, uh, our approach, or any uh, uh, comments or suggestions or, or your experiences with trainings. Anyone? Yeah. Hi, I'm Ashish Taku. I was in the group B. Uh, my experience was awesome with the course. It was completely peer-to-peer -peer learning, I can say. I will turn tutor as more as a facilitator when we were learning things. One thing I need to point out is like um, with the learning internet governance here. Uh, and actually we learned some points out there that users should be, like when we're learning about content management, it should be provided by ISPs, controlled by ISPs, government, or it should be user control. So why don't we do one thing, like start up a new panel or some sort of that thing, because we know youth are the one who are mo using more internet and providing content on them. So we have more so social blogging sort of thing, where we move into that blogs where which are uh, used by youths, so that we can control them more. We can give them some education, like you are the one who are putting in content on the internet. So why don't you come in and just train them about this thing, like this is a problem, an issue coming out, like when you are blogging something, when other youths and don't know about internet governance, Generally, youths uh, don't have much idea about internet governance when they are in basic level. So why don't we move into that blogging system where we control them and just give them a basic idea of internet governance and how they can learn things and how they are responsible for the content on the internet. So I really want to take this forward in this way. In my way, I will actually start doing this thing in my college and other sites where I think the youths of India are moving into uh, blogging and discussing things. So why don't we tell, teach them also some basic aspects of internet governance? That's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very good example of what we can do forward. Uh, with uh, when we started, Diplo had expertise in diplomacy. Uh, that was the first thing. Then uh, when internet governance issues started being high on the agenda and Jovan and the other uh, fellows, senior fellows got involved, that's how we developed uh, this part. Now, we probably have the interest in, in youth, uh, uh, and you might be the ones to, to try s uh, running this, preparing the materials and, and the courses, and Diplo would be very happy to, to assist with that, yes. Uh, Deirdre? Responding to the last speaker, sorry, um, in this room this morning, is that working? In this room this morning, I came to a panel on identity, and what had happened was the panel was cancelled or moved, but the participants had stayed behind and started a discussion of their own. And one of the issues that came up 
was the lack of knowledge of what you were letting yourself in for when you joined something like Facebook, not only with young people, with older people as well. So I think your suggestion is really excellent. I, th I, I believe rather strongly in internet governance from the bottom up, but you cannot govern yourself if you don't know what the context is, you don't understand the environment. So I think that's a really excellent idea. And I'm a Diplo old girl as well. Thank you. Um, let me go one by. Hello. Hi, Shreya. Uh, it was really a pleasure doing all this. And th this great learning that I had here was something really very valuable. And uh, apart from that, I, I wish to share my, my own experience regarding this. That uh, first of all, the application that I filled up uh, got rejected because uh, Ginger got my application with uh, unfulfilled answers. I don't know how. Might be cause uh, some problem with connectivity or something like that. And uh, she told me next that uh, she mailed me that my application is not completed. I did it again and got selected. But uh, on the day the course was about to be started, I met with an accident, and uh, then again I was in hospital. I was like, oh my gosh, when I'll probably, probably Almighty doesn't want it or whatever. But uh, after that, when I came back after a fortnight, she was so cooperative, and I was able to complete this whole course very nicely because of her and my tutor. And uh, apart from that, I want to share one more thing that uh, uh, when we talk of uh, having the youth panel, that uh, yesterday evening also we were discussing about it. Uh, today morning I attended a session and um, it was with the uh, Youth Protection Roundtable. So uh, what I feel is that we can, uh, we can have collaboration with them too when we are making and initiating this thing with Youth Protection Roundtable because they already are in existence and are working on the various issues regarding youth and uh, online privacy protection and all these things. So I feel that we can work in collaboration with them too. And uh, uh, one more advice I have that while working, uh, while sitting there in booth, uh, there was uh, someone from forensic department of India, and uh, he was asking me about all uh, all the courses that Diplo offers. And uh, what he asked me was that to uh, to ask you all the Diplo guys to start a, a separate uh, a separate kind of course regarding privacy issues, so that the forensic department can. Uh, they can, they want to train their employees actually, and they want a separate kind of uh, specialized tailored kind of course regarding privacy issues. And uh, he was quite keen about it. I to, I have given the contact to them, so I would uh, like suggest to have this too, so that it would be much more beneficial. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Regarding uh, privacy, uh, this is again a good idea. The, our problem is that we started with uh, five people, now we have like 20 people which are employed, uh, and we have a community of 400 people with excellent ideas, but it's quite hard to manage. Definitely we will think about it, including security and privacy and other issues, uh, and you can help us very much I mean, to, to, to set that up. On the other thing that you mentioned, I think this was a, a, an excellent point of co cooperation with the other organization or group of people that is already working on youth. Not many people on IGF would be thinking like that. Seriously, I mean, this is an excellent mindset that you start thinking about, hey, something already exists, Let, let's just join them. No, most of the people just say, no, let's do something on our own. Excellent, just do that. Uh, let me pass on the mic. 
Thank you, Vlada. I'm Nevin Taufi from Egypt. I would like to support very much the idea of this youth blog or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, training. In addition to the youth roundtable, we'll be very happy also to cooperate because our project is based on youth in Egypt, the empowerment of youth from different perspectives concerning safety as well as con concerning digital literacy in general. So we are on uh, in this respect. We're very happy about the idea. We'd like, of course, to add to that the safety component, if we could uh, uh, develop a curriculum on uh, this uh, issue as well uh, and in this case we'll need of course to consider the different uh, age brackets that would, we would like to address uh, of course to be relevant to our audience. Um, uh, I have a question, is Diplo also uh, forming uh, trainers or tutors in addition to students? Do you have a program for trainers? Thanks, Nimid. Um, yes, we, we did start doing that because our approach is to uh, bring successful participants from previous years to start tutoring because the course is, is growing and growing and we need new, new, new people, of course. Uh, and this is a general concept and we are trying to bring new people every year from the previous year, some of the best ones to become tutors. Uh, we did introduce that uh, two years ago, we still have it as an internal program, so all the tutors now have to be, uh, have to be a certified diploma tutors, they go through the course, but it's not a public one yet. Uh, Probably because we have a sp quite a specific approach to online learning, so they have to go through our uh, our methodology. But this is an idea to open it in some near future for the on for the other online learning types and, and uh, approaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the for the suggestion. Thank you. So I have a smaller uh, suggest suggestion here uh, about uh, something that came up when I was uh, talking to other uh, participants. And uh, uh, I, I think we could share more uh, what is going on in other groups. I told that to, to Morelia another day because uh, especially when you go to a, through advanced phase and research phase, uh, I. Uh, became interested in, in all teams and we have to choose one, two, or uh, so. Uh, and I, I feel that I don't know and uh, there is no uh, sharing, although we have the presentations, but for example, we don't have those presentations at uh, Ning or at um, the, the mailing list. So there is, a, it's a smaller suggestion, just something that we can do uh, to, to share. What is going on in IPv6 discussions? What are the results uh, in e-voting and so on? So that's just uh, my point. Um, hi, I'm... Uh, Hi, I'm Ravi Parshwampuriya. I was uh, part of the Internet Governance Capacity Building Program for India, sponsored by Nexi. Uh, before that, I did not have any idea about Internet Governance. I, I knew about some of the issues like security and multilingualism, but uh, frankly speaking, we were not aware what exactly are the issues that involve Internet Governance. And uh, one of our professors introduced us to this course, and uh, this was our first experience with the online learning. And uh, uh, as Siva said, like uh, after initial one or two classes, we never felt that we were in an online environment. It always felt that we are in a real, real life classroom. And our tutor was Priyanti, and she was always behind us. Like uh, even in the real environment, the teachers are not uh, concerned about uh, teaching the students whether they are learning or not. But in this case, uh, Priyanti and Ginger were always behind us that whether you have finished your assignments on time, are you, have you, are you clear with the um, content that is there on the um, learning classroom? And uh, they were always there to help us. Uh, uh, we, we had a discussion with Vlada yesterday regarding the youth. I was one of the panelists uh, in the youth uh, workshop. And it was sad that uh, there were very few people, especially the youth, who were part of the session. And there were people of the age of 30, 35, 40 who were speaking in the youth panel. Maybe uh, there were not a lot of people who already knew about that there's a session going to happen. Uh, I was part of your session also um, about the U Egypt, uh, the way they are empowering the youth, they are involving, they have a committee for the youth. So we were thinking if something can be replicated in India as well, because as all of us know that uh, India is the, uh, it is India where there is maximum number of youth. 
people in the age group from 20 to 30 or something. So probably if something like that, and like Ashraya said, if we can replicate, if we can collaborate some international organizations, and uh, if we can do something in India, and uh, like uh, or like as Vlada is yesterday suggested that uh, collaborate various people and take it to the. Um, uh, multi-advisory uh, stakeholder committee and there should be uh, more youth involvement in each of the panels as well. So I think it will be a great way forward because as youth are the people who are going to take this process forward. So I think it will be a good initiative if we are able to start something and I think we can do something. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this. I guess this is uh, uh, the, the two things that I think that I see out of this. First one is that it was a great use of bringing all of you here because of new initiatives. And the second one is a proof that we uh, don't only drink and celebrate during the evenings, but also talk about business, which is good. I'll take the last question. I'll then take a few comments from the floor, and then we move to the second part. We're running out of time. Uh, second part will be dealing with, uh, uh, with the initiatives that are linked to our capacity building program, uh, partner, uh, partner initiatives and the experiences of, of the fellows. Would you like to keep the question for the second one? or? Okay, good. Uh, let, let us hear brief comments from, from the panelists and then we move on. I think, I think I talk too much. That's why he said brief. It's for, for me. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to comment, it sounds a little funny to have a college student saying our teachers were after us to get our assignments in on time or checking in on us. Why do we do this when you would think that at this level, I'm talking about PhDs, I'm talking about professionals, I'm talking about presidents of a company. Why do I have to do this? Because these are students, and I had this experience myself in a master's program, you sit with you and your computer. Nobody knows if you show up for class or not. Nobody knows if you did your assignment. You feel like you're alone. Not even your colleagues, not even your fellow participants know if you went to class or not. So if the teacher's not aware, if we lose that human touch, if we lose that, you come to class and the teacher says, hey, well, well, where were you last week? We don't have that online if we let it escape from us. We need to keep that human touch or we're not acting as teachers. When we are teachers and facilitators, as I pointed out, the content is there. We cannot relegate the human role to a machine and to the internet. Yeah, I just, I just want to make uh, some observations about uh, whatever is discussed uh, on youth participation in line with uh, what uh, Dida has uh, observed. In the internet, uh, do we have uh, any distinction between age groups? Do we have a uh, age group for, I mean, do, do we have an internet for youth and do we have an internet for elderly people? Well, it's one thing to encourage youth participation in internet governance. It's one thing to, one thing for uh, youth to get together and um, contribute to the policy making process. But it's, it's another thing to exclude uh, other uh, age groups. And so, whatever activities that the youth are planning. If you can combine the wisdom of the elderly people, yeah. people who are older, then the youth will have much greater clarity in doing whatever it is that you want to do. The other age group is certainly not against your point of view and the conventional topics of uh, generation gaps, I don't think any longer uh, exist in the scale in which it existed uh, before. So there is a greater harmony of opinion and um, so like what she said, uh, interacting with uh, other age groups will give you an idea of the context and will uh, give you greater wisdom and so that's the point that I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, to what Ginger was telling about uh, regarding follow-up, because it's sometimes 
uh, sometimes uh, little uh, the tutors can tend to get a little worried if the student don't uh, post the links on time then we would always send a reply are you all right and then again if the student doesn't reply after about another two days did you get the email are you okay are you busy so something like that because it, it really keeps the class moving and i am sure the, even the students feel that they are you know they are part of the learning uh, classroom it, i would say it's more of not a really a classroom it's like a family because whereas although we have really seen each other, when we come here, it's as if we have known we have known each other for a long time. So it's unbelievable. In ten weeks, it has made such a good bond between each every each and everybody, and also I mean bond through the through the man-made uh, telecommunication system and man-made man-made computers. So the human touch is the most important thing, and. It's very nice when the student respond quickly, but then uh, it's because it's a different range of uh, participants. Some of them who are, you know, quite uh, advanced in their career. Some of them are students, and they might be busy with exams, and as one of our participants might be sick. So it's it's like that. So it's always the interactivity that it's keeping the thing going. Thank you, Priyanti. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ambassador Rana is uh, one of our senior fellows who is also a professor on diplomatic courses, right? Supposedly. Uh, I, I jump into this conversation as somebody who has just arrived here today and um, has been in and out of the room, so please forgive me if I'm not absolutely um, up to speed with all the comments you've made. But I do want to stress one point particularly. Distance learning is a very generic term. Distance learning exists in many formats. Um, IGNU, for example, the Indira Gandhi National Open University, which my Indian friends would know intimately, has classes in which there are 5, 6, 10, 15, 20,000 students. That is one kind of distance learning, which is obviously for a large um, mass audience, one may say. What Diplo talks about and what all these young people have been through is intensive distance learning that involves, <coughs> as our colleague uh, who was the first speaker, uh, pointed out very graphically with all the examples that were shown, involves intense interaction within a class, within a group. So much so that sometimes as the teacher I get the feeling that I'm left behind. I mean, these guys have taken over, and they are marching ahead, uh, much ahead of me, and I have to run up at my young 71 to try and catch up with them. So it's a very intense process. And I'm a little surprised that other companies, other institutions, other professions don't use this method more than they seem to use. because. It's not just for teaching internet governance or diplomacy or any particular subject, but any professional subject in which you need intense interaction within a fairly small group, let's say 20 people, ideally not more than 20, but maximum 25. And then as was shown on the, on the chart, I think by our Sri Lankan colleague, if I'm not mistaken, um, the different layers at which the class interaction takes place. And um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, spend a little time and go into this, because it is the intensity of the interaction that is unique. First, the hypertext entries, that's one layer. There is the writing of a seminar paper and the seminar forum. And by golly, that produces some extraordinary strokes of brilliance. Uh, People come up with documents that I didn't even know existed. My, my class throws at me stuff that they have trawled through the internet. So that's why I say uh, these guys are way ahead of anybody else. I mean, uh, I don't really feel I'm a teacher. I'm also a fellow student. We are all embarked on a journey. I don't want to say more, but it's a very interesting experience. And I, I wonder why lawyers and, and teachers of um, you know people who do do graphics or people who do uh, um, chartered accountancy don't use these methods for intense interaction. It's actually a wonderful way also for epistemic dialogue, dialogue between communities 
that are bound together by a shared interest. They don't have to have a professor or a teacher. You need a coordinator just to carry the ball forward. Part of the problem is that it isn't, till today, a shrink-wrapped product that you can buy, stick into your machine, and bingo, it goes. I think the, the uh, LMS is the learning management systems are not sufficiently stable as yet so that you can buy a product and run it with yourselves. I mean, Diplo invests a lot of money, a lot of effort uh, into keeping up the learning management system to its evolving demands. And we as teachers, students, we keep making new demands on the LMS. So it's a very, very interesting process. Worth getting into if you're interested. Thank you, Vlada. My apologies for jumping into your discussion. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. OK, so we are moving to the next part, uh, second part, uh, which is if we have done a capacity building program, we have a lot of participants and successful students which develop further some actions. And also on our side, on Diplo side, we try to um, get linked to some uh, other institutions that are doing similar job in, uh, in the world. Uh, training not only in internet governance, but also in the second second step, if I may put it away, which is ICT policy, ICT policy, uh, developing ICT policy and ICT strategy. Commonwealth and uh, specifically Commonwealth Connect program is definitely one of one of those which is doing a great job in trainings in in uh, ICT policy, and uh, I'm I'm happy to to greet uh, uh, Tony Mink, who is uh, from the IG, from the Commonwealth Secretariat and also from the Commonwealth Connect program, to briefly present you um, Commonwealth activities and uh, our partnership, deeper partnership with Commonwealth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vlad. Um, actually, it's a, it's a pleasure, uh, given this opportunity by Vlad, to say a couple of words about the collaborative um, work we've done with Diplo. And before I start, I, I think it's incumbent upon me to give you just a bit of background on the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat. We are made up of um, 53 countries, and uh, we have about 3 billion uh, population as part of that 53 countries that are in the Commonwealth. We do have um, uh, one similar language that permeates all 53 countries, and that's English. Our legal system is based on the British uh, legal system. And one of the unique characteristics that we have, <laughs> I'll just turn this off for a minute, is that um, the unique proposition that we have is that we open doors where other international organizations um, don't really have the ability to open doors. Because we do share a similar heritage, we have a common language, and we, we are also part of the British Empire. So with that in mind, uh, I just want to turn your attention to a couple of slides I would like to take you through. And, but I want to take you through from a different perspective, because we've used the Diplo uh, graduates to, in a very successful way. So as you graduate, I'm sure, as you can see, right, there are opportunities whereby, through the auspices of Diplo, we can use the services of the graduates uh, that actually went through the, uh, the Diplo uh, situation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, in terms of partnerships, the Commonwealth Connects program must have partnerships. For the simple reason is that the amount of funds that we have in the program is very, very limited. So for us to stretch the funds that we have and actually maximize the return on our limited resources, we need to create partnerships. And Diplo is one of the partnerships that we're actually progressing as, as much as possible. It reduces duplication and avoids confusion. Because when I was in the African region, they're saying to me, Tony, you're doing this. The World Bank is doing this. Other organizations are doing the same thing. But we have different methodologies. So the only way we can have a very coherent capacity building approach to the regions that we serve in the Commonwealth is to partner with similar organizations to deliver a single methodology. Right? So partnerships are important in terms of duplication and avoiding confusion. It leverages the unique value add that each partner brings to the table. And one of, my, one of the things that I have to do is to have partnerships with funding organizations. Because the limited resources that we have, we can't fund all the projects. So part of the work that we need to do is to actually create a brokerage role whereby we can actually broker a deal between those countries that do require resources and the actual uh, you know, the funding agencies that we do have a relationship with. With Diplo, I can rest, rest assured with Diplo that any program that we deliver with Diplo 
adds a significant amount of credibility. And that's why, you know, I think I'll be continuing to work with Vlad as long as possible, as long as he can tolerate me. <laughs> it also facilitates an integrated and harmonized approach to regional challenges, right? So anytime you're delivering a program on a regional basis, especially when you're looking at national strategies, there is where you have to have a very integrated and harmonized approach for that region. That means now that once you have a harmonized approach, it will minimize any interoperability issues, right, that you may have between countries within that region. Next slide, thanks. <laughs> so some of the things that we've did, we've created some multifaceted par partnerships in the public and, the pu public and private sector domain. One of the projects we have is refurbishing computers. So we have a partnership with Microsoft, Unido, uh, the government of Colombia, Trinidad and Tobago. And here we're taking old computers, fixing them up, and sending them into schools and community access centers. We have an ICT framework for teachers uh, because there's a significant demand for teachers who have the ability to teach ICT so that they can develop a curriculum and also teach that curriculum. So we've created some partnerships with Microsoft, UNESCO, Cisco, Intel. And, uh, and I think this is probably going to be one of the more popular or success stories we're going to have because quite a lot of countries, they do want to have a knowledge economy. And before they can do that, they need to have the teachers that actually can create that knowledge economy and create a labor force that has a knowledge in terms of ICT. We're also leveraging the expertise, right, of the Commonwealth lead agencies. And these, all these agencies, Commonwealth IT is based in Malta. We have the, the Commonwealth Tech, uh, Telecommunications Organization, Commonwealth of Learning, et cetera. We've actually le leveraged the expertise in these countries to actually implement projects for us. And we have 11 of those across all three regions in the Commonwealth. We delivered an e-partnership summit. Um, we have some e-health uh, work going on together with disaster management. And again, right, uh, we are quite happy in terms of including Diplo, right, as part of the collaborative uh, frameworks we are, we've actually developed. So on the next slide, I'm going to turn my attention more specifically to Diplo. Um, Diplo does not only do ICT work for the Commonwealth Secretariat. I think we've had a successful collaboration with Diplo for the past six years. And they've done a lot of work in terms of governance. And, um, and recently, I think there's some work in terms of teaching uh, senior executives in the public sector, right, including ministers, right, in terms of how to be diplomats, how to work and make effective use, right, of the resources that they have within the ministry. So the value add that I see in Diplo is that they have a wide network. And I see that network growing. And the testimonials that I've heard today, right, I mean, it just reinforces the fact that, um, you know, Diplo is doing a lot of good work and we need to work much closely together in the future. Diplo is well known and respected, right? I mean, I've spoken to a lot of the clients that I've um, delivered um, workshops for, and many of them do have very good things to say about Diplo. So I'm um, glad I think you're doing something good. So keep on doing what you're doing. Successful collaboration developed over the last uh, five to six years, right? And as I mentioned before, that's something we need to ensure that we perpetuate into the future. So on the last slide, I don't want to bore you too much, but what we've done so far with the Internet Governance Forum is... Um, we had a workshop in Botswana in August 2008 that was, I think, a resounding success. All the delegates that attended from the Southern African countries, right, this is probably the first time they were introduced to internet governance issues. And I think Vlad actually stressed a lot in terms of the IP6, to, uh, sorry, IP4 to IP6 issue. Because at this point in time, they need to start dealing with these issues. They can't wait until two years from now to start looking at, okay, what do I need to do to get myself ready to move to IP6? So Vlad has done a really good work there. And we also dealt with things like infrastructure, right? Uh, Cybercrime, electronic commerce. Those are the issues that I think are quite relevant and timely for the Southern African countries. We've also used uh, Diplo in terms of assisting us in implementing and delivering a capacity building workshop and national ICT strategies, right? And um, we've used uh, two of the Diplo um, graduates, we have Emmanuel at the back here, and Mwende, I think, uh, from Kenya, we've used her and I don't see her here, but uh, these folks did a great job, right? And working with Vlada, we actually de designed a program whereby we do have a methodology. The first half of the day is dealt strictly with concepts, and the second half is dealing with how do you apply those concepts to case studies that are relevant to that regional area. So bringing um, Emmanuel and, and Mwende, I think, brought that regional perspective, right, to the actual delivery of this workshop. So this was uh, actually happened in November 2008. We're having a similar uh, workshop in Barbados, February 2008. And then we have a similar one that we deliver in Asia Pacific that will happen uh, May 2009. And I'm hoping that uh, I can work 
very closely with Vlad to actually deliver these programs, either using Diplo Foundation or at least the graduates from Diplo. Again, it stresses why national ICT strategies are important, right? Because it's important for the simple reason it elevates the priorities of national ICT strategies. It also ensures right, what you're doing in national ICT strategies enable governments to implement their development goals and, um, and objectives. We've also developed a framework and a methodology, and then we're dealing with some of the implementation issues right, regarding how to implement uh, the quick wins and the Pathfinder projects emanating from the national ICT strategies. So in closing, we are very happy with Diplo, <laughs> and hopefully I can see some of you folks working with uh, the Commonwealth Connects program in delivering not only these kinds of programs, but future programs that we have in mind. So thank you very much, Vlad. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tony. Um, just a, a, a brief comment on, on our experience from Swaziland. It was really a pleasure to work with, uh, with people that basically came there without any idea what they are going to do. Uh, uh, except for, for uh, just a slight introduction uh, from, from uh, the organizers in advance. Uh, but they did an excellent job and made fabulous templates for ICT policies and, and strategic plans for their countries, or some imagine it, countries within seven days. Uh, and uh, then we, we encouraged them to go on uh, in an online platform, Diplo online platform. So we didn't have much time because of the IGF uh, circus around. We were totally hectic, but we hope that, that they're going to go on with, with, uh, with uh, working together. And this is one of the examples, again, of, of a good cooperation. Now we're moving to a completely different, uh, different issue, which is, this was the partner's per, uh, perspective. Now we want to hear from one of the students, which was, uh, uh, of course, one of the most successful, but uh, he got involved into the issues that he, he just felt like uh, interesting, which was youth, which was uh, remote participation and other things. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm passing on the microphone to Rafik to tell you of his experiences and, and where he found himself in the IGF process after the course. Hello, hello everybody. So uh, don't worry, it will be short. 